Hello. Today I want to talk about the studio. Like many of you, uh, I can't go to the studio during lockdown. So at the moment, my studio consists of a single wall upstairs in the house. And for this reason, I've been focusing on experiment with how my montage works will be displayed or arranged on the wall rather than making them from scratch in a studio. However, for most of my life, I've not even had a studio. My work's been socially engaged or based on information or working with the public. Uh, it was not made beforehand, uh, so I didn't need a studio to make it. For me then, lockdown has been a kind of reminder of the reasons why I chose a post-studio practice in the first place. It's important that we find practical ways to respond to the loss of the studio, but it's also an opportunity to reconsider the studio more fundamentally. This is what I want to do in this short video. How can the studio be defined? What was the studio invented for? What social and cultural values does the studio embody? So I want to build a picture of the studio as a specific social form. And I'm going to do this by tracing how the studio emerged historically and what values were attached to it at that time and look at how these values have been maintained or modified or challenged. Before doing this though, I want to mention uh, a parallel development. Let me briefly consider Virginia Woolf's extraordinary book, A Room of One's Own. Based on a series of lectures given at two women's colleges in Cambridge University in October 1928. This is the book that Woolf famously imagines the fate of Shakespeare's sister. Equally gifted, she says, but female, Shakespeare's sister would not have gone to school to learn grammar and logic, would not have read Horace or Virgil, and like all women, would not have been permitted to act in the Elizabethan theatre, as her brother did. What if she picked up William's books once in a while, Woolf asks. Her parents would no doubt scold her and tell her to mend her stockings or mind the stew. Genius, she says, must have existed among women and the working class throughout history, but was always suppressed, undernourished, and would have felt more like a burden or a torture to them. Wolf argued that there are material preconditions for writing, which most women throughout history have been denied. Specifically, Wolf said, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Wolfe, therefore, addresses the question of the relationship between women and literature in a way that turns on the need for a place, a place designated as a workplace for a writer. Wolfe made a call for a room of one's own whilst acknowledging the context of routinized domestic violence against women in the home. Wolfe says rooms are places where daughters and wives are beaten. Women have been flung around the room, she says, or locked up in a room. A room of one's own, a room for writing, therefore, is a room isolated from domestic abuse and domestic toil. A room of one's own is not a room at all in that case. It is a social relationship within the household, which we project back onto the plan of the house. A room of one's own, therefore, in Wolf's conception, I want to say, is an institution of emancipation, and in her case, within and against the patriarchal space of the home. And yet a room of one's own is also a resource that most women and most of humanity have been denied throughout history. And therefore, I want to say, a room of one's own is a privileged space or a space of entitlement. So I want to acknowledge this without dismissing the emancipatory qualities that Wolf depicts so vividly and movingly. So the studio, let's say the studio is a room of one's own. It is therefore an institution of emancipation, as Wolf describes it, but also a space of privilege and entitlement. It is something closer to the latter that has been stressed in critical thinking in art theory about the studio since the 1960s. Generations of artists have left the studio to relocate their practice in industry, on the street, in the home, in the wilderness, or within the communal spaces of conviviality or at the social sites of struggle. The art critic Lucy Lippard witnessed the early stages of post-studio practices in minimalism and conceptualism in the 1960s, saying this, 
As more and more works are designed in the studio but executed elsewhere by professional craftsmen, and as the object becomes merely the end product, a number of artists are losing interest in the physical evolution of the work of art. The studio is again becoming a study. The art historian Caroline Jones put an even stronger emphasis on the critique of the studio in her important historical study of the passage from the romance of the studio in abstract expressionism to the post-studio practices of pop art, minimalism, site specificity and land art. In this, in this account, the studio was instrumental in constructing the myth of the artist as a heroic individual and therefore the abandonment of the studio was a ne necessary part of dismantling that myth. For her, the post-studio practices of the land artists, quote, moved out of the sacrosanct studio and therefore away from the city system and away from the galleries like Cuban. Giles Waterfield, the art historian, pointed out that until the 19th century, British artists preferred the term painting room to studio, and in France, the word studio referred to a one room apartment. What he calls the decline of the studio as the normative concept applied to places of artistic production is what is targeted by the French artist Daniel Beren who was one of the pioneers of post-studio practice. He said, the studio is the first frame, the first limit on which all subsequent frames and limits will depend. He identified two types of artist studio, the European type and the American type. The European type is modeled on the high ceiling Parisian room and the American type is characterized by a reclaimed loft, barn or warehouse. We can add to this list by placing the artist studio alongside the craft studio, the design studio, the writer's study, the architect's office, the musician's recording studio, the dance studio, the photography studio, or even the tattoo studio. So do these different studios have something in common or are they different types of studio therefore caught up in an ongoing struggle over what a studio might be or ought to be? One thing that all these studios have in common, I would say, is the history of the emergence of the studio out of the artisan workshop at the threshold of modernity. During the Renaissance, the studio developed out of the artisan workshops as part of the attempt to raise some of the art above handicraft. The studio, therefore, plays a significant role within the struggle to raise certain mechanical art into the liberal arts and, to say, uh, and that is to say, from handicraft and skilled manual work to the scholarly activities of the nobility. The old hierarchy of liberal and mechanical arts did not retain its force within the advent of capitalism. Here, the division between mental and manual labour and the subdivisions of skilled and unskilled work were more important. At the same time, labour was divided into a spectrum of new categories such as manufacturing, industrial work, craft, domestic labour, leisure, hobbies and so on. On this new basis, the studio is distinguished, in particular, from the factory, the office and the home. The studio continues to signify an activity that is distinguished from mechanical work, domestic drudgery, wage, labour, industry, commerce and administration. However, it's important to point out immediately here that the normative separation of the studio and the artist from industry, manual labour, commerce and the home was never accomplished in the way that the myth of the artist or the romance of the studio would have us believe. Prior to the invention of the studio, artisan workshops were typically within the home and all the apprentices and the day labourers would belong to the household. When the studio first separated itself, symbolically and spatially, from the workshop and the home, the work that went on within the within the studio continued to be dependent on manufacturing and domestic work that went on outside the studio walls. So the isolation of the artist within the studio was only possible when the various tasks undertaken by apprentices, day labourers and members of the household within the artisan workshop, making brushes, paper, pencils, mixing paints and so on, as well as preparing food and other necessary tasks, when these activities were either outsourced to commercial suppliers or classified as acts of familial love rather than work. In this way, the studio conceals the dependence of the artist on the work of others 
which the old artisan workshop couldn't hide. So, one of the problems with the studio, at least partly, is the way it reinforces the myth of the heroic, self-sufficient individual artist. But when, the min but when minimalist artists and conceptualists challenged the handicraft tradition of art production, the studio was also criticised as appearing to give too much of an emphasis on making and the art object. At the same time, the distinction between the studio and the workplace has also given rise to the critique of the studio as supporting the elitist elevation of art above craft and design and industry, and supporting the myth that the artist is not a worker. So there's a, there's a whole range of different problems with the studio which, which have been overlapped in critical practices of post-studio artists. Artists since the 1960s who have subjected the studio and its mythologies to critique, I want to say can be, de can be divided into two categories. The first, those who complete the severing of the studio from the workshop by thinking of their place of work as an office or a study uh, where conceptual work is done or design or project management. And those who heal the rift between the workshop and the studio by identifying artistic practice with engineering, factory work, uh, or other kinds of material production, including domestic work. Post-studio art practices appear to be critical or radical in comparison to working in the studio, which therefore appears to be more conventional, traditional, or conservative. However, if the studio is formed historically by the elevation of certain arts above handicraft, then it could be argued, and I certainly would argue, that certain types of post-studio art practice complete the shift by taking a greater distance from craft and manual work in the direction of scholarship, conceptual development and project management. This is con confirmed by Melissa Grunland's definition of post-studio art practice, which she describes in comparison with classical modes of art making in studios as being um, mainly discursive and organisational. What is neglected, I would say, in the celebration of post-studio practices is the extent to which the roving artist occupying a variety of sites has internalised a studio and carries the social relations of the studio from place to place. If the room of one's own is not a room, but a social relationship expressed in spatial terms, then the studio too is not a specific type of room or building, but a social relationship that distinguishes the artist from the non-artist. In that case, the absolute affirmation of the social distinction of the artist is not the studio, but the artist who remains an artist without having a studio. And yet, as I said earlier, I don't want to lose sight of the studio as a space of liberty, autonomy and safety. The studio may be a room of one's own, or a wall or a desk of one's own. It might even be an afternoon to oneself or a sequence of meetings that one has chosen to have with collaborators and participants. The studio doesn't have a particular shape and it doesn't predetermine a certain kind of activity. The 60s idea that studios are for making objects rather than something more conceptual is no longer true. The studio, as I've tried to outline in this video, is not a place or a specific activity, but just a social relation. Since the lockdown has suspended so many of our explicit social markers of our established social relations, we've been able to see these social relations from a different perspective. We've started to look at changing patterns of living and working, and finding new ways of maintaining sociality without physical contact. Like these, the studio is not just something that we will want to reoccupy after the lockdown, it's something that we are finding new ways to occupy today. Some artists will have attempted to replicate the physical space of the studio in their homes, or have reimagined the studio altogether. In this sense, lockdown has generalised an experience of the studio that has been called for since the 1960s. Claire Doherty, the brilliant curator who edited the book Contemporary Art from Studio to Situation, actually doesn't argue for a post-studio practice, but rather a remapping of the relationship between the studio and society. So she says, Daniel Barron once said that all his work proceeded from the extinction of the studio. If we understand the studio as a space of imagination rather than the locus of creative activity prior to the presentation of the work, 
then perhaps we should not be encouraging the artist to exit the studio, she said, but rather that the studio be immersed in the situation of place. I want to take this inquiry one step further by saying that the studio is not just a single fixed social relationship. It's not just the place that designates the elitist elevation of the artist above the artisan or is the home of the heroic masculine genius. It's the assumption that the studio represents one particular social relation that leads commentators to dismiss it outright or to defend it to the death. The point, however, I want to say is to see the, to the studio as a tool for reconfiguring the social relations of artistic production. The studio is not a template for activity that artists must conform to or liberate themselves from. The studio is not given. It is formed and reformed, shaped and reshaped by the social relations that artists develop in their practices.